Uh, this is the March uh, 2021 monthly review. Um, okay, before we get started, uh, why should we listen to us? Who are we? Uh, obviously, we are Rand Swiss. We were rated the, the number one stockbroker in the country in 2019, and obviously a much smaller firm than the, the likes of Standard Bank and Absa, who are normally winning it. Um, you know, we also ranked for top advice broker. We won the People's Choice Award, and then last year we won uh, top. Uh, Top online broker and best tax free savings account. We actually slipped the second place in the overall ranking Standard Bank beta. So well done to them. Um, hopefully 2021, one of the reasons we do all these presentations is to support our client base. And hopefully you guys go out and vote for us when the, the voting is due in uh, September. It's so kind of always been our dream to build a really excellent business. And uh, you know, I suppose that's it. It's not all about the money for us. I mean, it's, we want to make you money, of course, because it makes you happy. But it's also just about building a really, really high quality business. Uh, what do we do? We do, okay, we've basically got seven different business units at the moment. So the one is online trading. That's really where you guys do everything yourself. Um, then we've got private broking. If you've got a little bit more money uh, and you want to chat to someone about the ideas and you want to, you know, you want to make the decisions on whether you buy or sell shares or instruments and structures or whatever it may be. Uh, but this puts someone in your corner that will actually, you know, chat to you. It's not just an online system that you've left to your own devices. Uh, you've got someone that's responsible for your performance as well, but you make the final buy and sell decisions. Uh, manage portfolios. That's kind of what I take care of. Uh, this is where you give up total discretion and say, guys, I like what you say. You guys manage the money for me. Um, you can obviously come directly to us. We work with IFAs as well. So we've got wealth managers that uh, you know, use our, our kind of uh, discretionary portfolios as part of a, a holistic wealth plan. Uh, but of course, the public is welcome to come directly to us as well. Um, Verb takes care of structured products. Uh, it's kind of a medium risk thing. We look at credit notes. We've launched a really nice one. Um, uh, basically with our Swiss partners. Uh, so that's a Nova and a Swiss quote. Um, yeah, lovely, lovely worst of index. So we'll have more of those coming out as well, but they kind of, we do them as IPOs. They're generally three to five year products that, uh, you know, you kind of do a book build on it. You go into the product um, and you locked in for three to five years, but uh, it's got a very, you know, it's a very conservative payoff for economy. You get some market upside, but you get capital protection as well. So, you know, if the markets fall 20%, you get all your money back kind of thing. So uh, those are credit products. Um, we obviously do offshore transfers as well, which uh, really has been booming in the last couple of days. I think as the Rand approached 1450, we've just seen like a huge flood of cash going out. Um, and we obviously facilitate the whole move from, you know, kind of clients that want to, you know, correctly externalize funds. They're not going to take a Bitcoin and go and buy and sell it and then get into all sorts of trouble with the Reserve Bank when they try and bring their money back. Um, so yeah, we, we take care of all the BOP and the paperwork and we've obviously got an institutional, uh, we registered with the Reserve Bank. So we've got uh, obviously institutional pricing as well, which we can pass on to you guys because our primary business really is stockbroking and managed portfolios overseas um, and locally, but you know, majority of our money these days does sit overseas. Um, and then we've got a, a burgeoning wealth management arm as well, run by Yaku, who uh, you know takes care of the, the whole the whole advice process. If you're sitting here going, oh, I need to manage my money, but I don't know what's going on. I need someone in my corner that's really going to give me a formal recommendation. Look at my personal situation. That's where Yaku comes in. And of course, we've got tax-free savings accounts, which are amazing little products. We won best tax-free savings provider in 2020. Uh, I hope we win it again because essentially, if you if you have other products with us, you can get a free tax-free savings account with us, and we we, we do it through a stockbroking license, which means that you're not locked into these uh, small interest products. You can go and buy. I think it's about 60 ETFs that you can buy in there. Of course, you pay no CGT, so you get all the growth of an equity market. But uh, you know you're going to save an enormous amount of capital gains tax when you eventually go to cash. Now, very nice product. Uh, Valve has taken care of that for the business for us. Okay, so what are we talking about today? Uh, first thing I'm going to go through is just a global overview of what's happening in the world. Uh, it's kind of a dashboard that we do once a month, just to kind of like keep tabs on all the different uh, areas. We'll chat commodities. We're going to chat currencies. We'll have a quick look at fixed income markets, and I'm going to run you through the the, the ideas and strategy on on the managed portfolio. I've actually moved some of it. Yeah, we haven't done any new uh, twists and turns in the portfolio this month. Um, because we had quite an active uh, first quarter, just uh, repositioning ourselves as you know, we've had a big run up in, in certain energy markets. So I'm just going to, you know, if you weren't on the presentation last night, I'll just quickly run through the, the changes there, um, as well as the new the new REIT that we put in the portfolio. So I will give you that. Um, yeah, I did a whole lot. We're doing. We're actually launching a new local portfolio as well. So it's, it's open. It's in. Uh, we're taking client funds in for it, based the same strategy that that we use for the, the offshore portfolio, but for local markets. 
Um, we shut it down just through, through lack of interest in, in the past, but I think everyone was just wanting to go overseas. You know, around Swiss, it's kind of what we do, so it makes sense. But we, we're only getting a lot more interest in the local market now, which is very, very encouraging. So we've kind of put, you know, we, we put together the strategy at the beginning of the year, and that's now rolling. So we can chat a bit about local stuff as well if you are interested, but we can handle that as we go. So uh, the first uh, thing, global market overview. What's been happening in the last month? Okay, so if you remember last month, if you were at last month's presentation, you'll remember that we had an absolute decimation in Chinese markets. Now, this performance is all done in US dollar terms. So there's no, you know, this is a constant currency. Um, China last month fell about 7%. It hasn't recovered this month. There's still huge issues around Chinese stocks at the moment. Got to remember the Chinese market is a very retail driven market. It's, it's not like South Africa. South Africa is dominated by Alan Gray, Coronation, so big institutional fund managers that control the majority of our, of our asset flow. Now, obviously, in, uh, in China, it's very, very different. It's a very retail driven market. You think kind of almost Chinese Robinhood traders. Um, you know, when they get canopy, they sell off and stocks collapse when, when they get excited, stocks rally massively. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of volatility in the, market, in the Chinese markets. I think what's really concerning people with China at the moment is just a crackdown on the, on the regulations as well. If you remember, <clears throat> Jack Ma went missing for about five, five months. No one really knew where he was. Everyone was concerned that Xi Jinping had disappeared him. Um, at the Chinese market still, they're, they're concerned around the, the regulation that's coming through, but especially regulation around big tech. So the likes of Baidu, Tencent, et cetera. It's, it's a concern for, for market participants. And we haven't seen Chinese markets performing nearly as well as you would have expected, uh, given the, um, no, I suppose, given the, the, the ultra accommodative monetary policy that we've got at the moment. So the huge fiscal stimulus that's coming through, the, the huge monetary stimulus that's in place at the moment, you would expect that to go and hunt for yield in developing, uh, in developing markets and emerging markets, markets like South Africa. Um, and certainly like China as well. But, uh, but so far, yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't played out for China. It is playing out for us. So we can see uh, we actually were up 6% in, in dollar terms this, this month. Now, absolutely, our, our stocks have performed wonderfully well. The local market has been, been really pushing. Um, I'll show you why in, in the next couple of slides. Um, but it's also our currency. Our currency has been incredibly strong. And that, that all comes down to you know, portfolio flows in and out. They start to you know, get a little bit of yield in, in South Africa when you're getting no yield overseas. And they're kind of concerned uh, that, that you, you, know, you might be sitting in products that, that aren't earning you interest. Uh, you see these, uh, the, the, the carry trade essentially playing into South Africa uh, nicely. Um, and that obviously lifts kind of the, the dollar value of all of the stocks as well. So. Um, UK, UK and Japan still underperforming. The Brexit continues. It's a problem. Um, you know, there's there's also concerns about the vaccine rollout, which in, in the UK, which we're going to look at. Um, Japan, Japan is the market that uh, you know it's it's almost a lost decade, <laughs> lost multiple decades. But Japan is always you know it's it's kind of it's got demographic problems. It's an aging population. They don't have the kind of growth. Uh, it's certainly not in markets that you get in in, in some of the more exciting territories. Um, okay, so I'm just going to lump the rest together with you uh, as Europe. Europe, you know, France and Germany, so kind of the core of Europe doing very well, even, even the, the, the periphery picking up too. Um, but yeah, best performing markets uh, in the world for the last month, back on top is the USA. Um, yeah, USA, it's, it's unfortunately, you look at what's happening in the US at the moment, it's one of the reasons that our portfolio is very, very skewed towards, um, uh, to, towards the US. And uh, okay, looking looking down the road, will EM South Africa continue to run? It's a great question for my next slide. So let's let's have a look at that now. But the US for us, the US, you know, if you if you read business books and you kind of if you've done any analysis on US businesses and, and just the way that a US business operates compared to a, a South African business or a, a, a many businesses in emerging markets in Europe as well, um, the, the difference is that the US. They, they operate in a different way. It's the concept of your fire. It's the concept that that that, that U.S. companies are, 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 are even though I mean we're seeing uh, cultural changes in, in the U.S. at the moment, but they still have this 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 responsibility that is very different from 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 the rest of the world. It's it's that true capitalist meritocracy attitude, and for that reason, U.S. companies I mean are are incredibly robust. Um, now, obviously, with Biden coming in and kind of, you know, almost the more social reforms coming through, we're going to see corporate tax rates being hiked in the U.S. Um, that is going to, to knock some value off U.S. companies. 
but at the moment, uh, you know, the, 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 the economic numbers that have been coming out of the US have been strong enough that people are optimistic that uh, the US is going to, to continue to grow. Even with my corporate tax rate, you know, these stocks are going to be worth a lot more as the globe starts to recover. Now, yeah, if you, if you, if you look at it, uh, you know, just from an intellectual point of view as well, so when I say intellectual, like kind of a brain point of view, um, we also see that most of the innovation is still happening in the US. I mean, and that, that innovation, those new exciting companies help to, to, to lift the, the, the stock market as well. Uh, Elon Musk was a South African. Unfortunately, he didn't launch Tesla in South Africa. He went to the US to launch Tesla because that's the, the, the innovation hub. And unfortunately, those markets include things like Tesla. Tesla doesn't get listed on the JSE. And it's, it's one of the big concerns uh, for, for me, frankly, around local investing, certainly. Um, yeah, and, and, but even, even kind of emerging market investing is that uh, you don't see those innovative new companies coming in. Now this, this uh, last week, we had the announcement from Anglo-American saying they're spinning off their, their thermal coal assets. Great for the JSC, we get a, I think it's gonna be called Tungela Resources. We're gonna get another listing on our exchange, but it's the wrong kind of listing. It's an established company that already has those assets listed on the exchange. It's just splitting the assets into, the, the assets into two separate listings. Um, and now, yes, great, it gives shareholders more choice. We can go and buy Tungela Resources. We can go and buy Anglo-American that doesn't have its dirty thermal coal assets in it. But it's not new venture capital companies coming up. It's not you know young companies coming from Silicon Cape coming and listing on the Alt X with a big idea and, and the ability to grow revenue dynamically. That that unfortunately is is, is, is we're lagging in that in South Africa. Um, whereas the US, the, there are exciting new businesses uh, you know coming on exchange all the time, and that's kind of what what's fueling the US the US thing. So to answer the question, will will EM continue to run down the road? It's very difficult to, to it's a difficult to answer beginning of the year, we did a what's happening over the next uh, 12 months view. And we said with lower interest rates, we expect that Huntley yield, we expect EM to pick up. We talked about uh, what happened when we had that real commodity boom. Uh, you, you know, we had kind of the commodity super cycle from 2000 to, 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 to say, let's say 20, you know, up to about the, the, the financial crisis. But even through that, because China was still consuming a huge amount of commodities, that was incredibly positive for emerging markets. And I remember sitting with uh, one of our analysts and, uh, and she was from Scotland. And she used to say, she was saying, and everyone was, you know, they weren't as pessimistic about South Africa as they are today, but she was looking at us going, you guys are crazy. You know, South Africa is the emerging market. It's, it's the frontier of finance. It's the most exciting place to make money. Um, and yet, uh, you know, everyone in Scotland and the UK, we look at the emerging market as the place, the place to go. Yet you guys all want to invest in the development market. So yes, I do think EM, you know, there, there's a potential that EM could, could turn that kind of narrative that you get better growth here, that uh, you've got, uh, you know, better population demographics uh, supporting the markets. Uh, it could return. The, the risks really for me are that the structure of the economies um, and the, and the, I suppose, the more socialist policies. You just don't. Uh, <laughs> everyone is asking me about SA as well. Yeah. So. It, it really is difficult. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I mean, there's huge risks in emerging markets, but there's huge rewards when it comes right as well. Will it run? I hope, I really do hope it will. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll talk about ADI a little bit later. Okay, so I'm just going to go on to the, the next slide. I'm going to sit here all day. It's 15 minutes. We haven't even started. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll handle ADI at the end of the Q&A. Um, okay, South Africa, best performing market. So now this is this is to the point on, on what's happening in South African markets. Now, I put this out on Twitter and everyone, you know, they're tagging Magnus Haystack and everyone that was pessimistic about South Africa is like, hey, but look at this. Look what Gary's put on the market. Now, of course, there's base effects in here as well. You know, if you look, if you look back, this, this chart, this is an annual chart and it's going back to you know, it's, it's exactly one year I did it this morning. So April, April 9th, 2020, what was happening in April 9th, 2020, we had the coronavirus. We were all locked in our houses. We couldn't even buy food off the shelf. I mean, we couldn't buy, we couldn't buy closed toed shoes. We couldn't buy, we couldn't buy, we, we weren't allowed to buy crop bottoms, whatever those, those things are. Um, but yeah, the, the stock market has had a stage collapse. So now, of course, we've got this you know, ridiculous dollar-based return coming out of South Africa. During, all of them are ridiculous. Um, and there is a base effect in there that South Africa potentially might have fallen a little bit further. But there's more to the story than just, uh, you know, South Africa was so weak that it just fell apart completely. And therefore, the, the, the rebound has been so much stronger than the rest. 
There's also the fact that we're getting a commodity rebound and that, that, that commodity story is starting to play through again. So just to run through it, China again, China is very, very weak. Retail driven, remember these are market performances. Uh, it's composite markets in, in each of the countries. And Japan, China, weak. Asia, Asia really struggling. Germany strong, Canada, France strong, US kind of mid table, but South Africa absolutely dominating. Now, why is it? Yes, a little bit of basic things. I do agree with that. But if you go here, just quickly, I looked at this, I was, well, I was shocked. So I said, let's go and look at like what has actually happened over the last year to our equities. Um, so I've got, I don't know if you guys ever read the Diamonds and Dogs column. So I thought, let's look at Diamonds and Dogs. Um, so look at, and then I just kind of put a market cap weighting on there. So you can see because, you know, okay, so one of all of these lists, uh, these are only companies with market caps above 10 billion uh, rand. Um, because obviously you, you get you know kind of big skews in, in, in various uh, you know in the, in the tiny the, 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 the micro cap sector, um, and that I didn't want that kind of like skew, skewing the story here. Um, but uh, yeah, if you have a look at it, like Amplats, I mean that is a substantial company. If you look at like a kind of a market weight, you know how much Amplats we have uh, an influence on our index uh, to give us this 82% up in dollar terms. You can see what's going on here. We've had a very, very strong currency, uh, you know, certainly from over the last year. You know, if we look at a currency chart back to April last year, we were probably at about 19, 14, 50 at the moment. The currency is playing in our favor. At the same time, in RAND terms, our commodity stocks, especially the platinum guys, are absolutely flying. Um, Royal Buffett and Platinum, RV Platts, Northern, uh, Sassel, obviously with the oil price recovery that we've seen. Remember, you know, at, at the same time a year ago, we had uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia getting into that spat and deciding just to pump as much oil as they can in the face of uh, collapsing demand. Um, and we had oil prices trading negative in, in some, some territories. Of it. Obviously, we had negative oil prices. Now we've got oil prices at $62 a barrel. You know, we've had a massive, massive increase in, 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 in oil prices as the, the, the kind of the, the anomaly that is the coronavirus work through the system. What has that done to a company like Sassel? 216% up. Implats, Amplats, you know, the platinum guys, you know, as the, the idea that there's going to be a larger demand for auto capital converters uh, comes through and, and, you know, car sales and vehicle sales are going to come back. Um, you know, the platinum has absolutely rocketed. Remember, platinum is a very concentrated supply as well. Russia, um, uh, Nor Norris Nickel, and a couple of Russian companies had some issues. They took some supply out of the market. And South Africa, we were shut down for a period. We worked through some of our inventories. And a lot of this, this platinum just hasn't found a home. When platinum really got a, uh, you know, it, it platinum fell, especially platinum fell in yen terms. So uh, one of the places that you can go to get really good platinum information is the Johnson Matthew, Johnson Matthew reports. The last one is in February, so I'm not going to cover it in the commodity section, but I might as well talk about it now. Next one's going to be out in May. So in next month's session, we'll go through the, the, the platinum market in a lot more detail uh, based on that Johnson Matthew report. But, um, but yeah, it, you know, essentially what happened in February, we saw a huge Japanese buying really, like in physical platinum. And it was because the yen, the yen platinum rate had fallen there as low, you know, to, to it was like a 20 year low. And we had Japanese people literally hoarding coins and bars and that supported the, you know, in a large way started to support the platinum market while the, the demand kept, uh, dropped out of uh, the jewelry and the auto capital into converter markets. But that's now coming back. And we've seen platinum, rhodium, palladium prices all spiking, that whole PGM basket. Um, and it's, I mean, it's doing amazing things for, for, the, for the platinum companies. And obviously with South Africa, almost, you know, we could almost be the OPEC of platinum if we put our minds to it. Um, benefiting from that. And that's one of the, the reasons that our market is up as much as it is. Um, and then, yeah, of course, we've got some others, you know, like there's some corporate actions as well, the likes of car track, uh, et cetera, but really good. What's, what's really hurting at the moment? It makes sense. British American tobacco. <laughs> that's the worst, you know, in, in the kind of 10, 10, uh, what is it? 10, uh, 10, billion, 10 billion rand at least and, and up. Uh, British American Tobacco are really the worst, um, the worst performer down 14% uh, year to date. That's in rand terms. Now, why is that? British American Tobacco is an enormous rand hit. You know, to go from uh, a 19 rand to, to the dollar rate uh, down to a 14 and a half rand to the dollar rate, of course, British American Tobacco is going to feel some serious pain in rand terms. Um, interestingly, you know, one of the, the quantitative scans that we run is basically, uh, you know, it, it takes how many analysts are, are looking at it. So institutional analysts are working for big banks and, and professional fund managers that publish their the, the, the views. 
Um, and then we kind of look at their price targets and we look at, uh, you know, basically the, the strength of their buys and sells and, and, and all that. You can kind of run a nice little model. On the South African market, which, which does suffer from a little bit of a lack of uh, coverage, so it does only really work on, on the larger cap stocks like, like, uh, like British American Tobacco. It is the highest rated stock from the fundamental point of view. Analysts are recommending you own British American Tobacco above everything else. It's had a horrible year. And just like you know, a couple of years ago, we were looking at the platinum stocks and the, you know, they were in the absolute bulges and now we've got a, you know, a massive run up. There might be an opportunity for a contrarian investor now, I think, to go and pick up uh, one of the, the dirty tobacco stocks, something like British American Tobacco, it pays a very good dividend. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, you know, while it's probably not a company I want to hold for 20 years, I think you know, from a valuation point of view, it's probably looking pretty good at the moment. So it's not the diamonds and dogs. That's kind of the, the story behind why South Africa has, uh, has done so well in dollar terms over the last year. Uh, as I said, very skewed from the coronavirus and, and the summer, uh, of course. So what's happening in the economy? Because it's not just the US economy, it's the, the um, you look at SA as well. So economic numbers, I'm going to run through quickly because we haven't had a lot of updates. We had some, some, uh, some jobs numbers coming out. Uh, the US unemployment rate continues to fall. Uh, which is great. It's still well above where the, the, the certainly where the Fed wants it. Um, they kind of seeing sub 4% now as, as, as frictional unemployment in the US. And they think that, that you know, that, that it can, uh, you know, it can get a lot lower. And for that reason, the ultra accommodative monetary policy certainly will stay in place for a while. The fiscal stimulus is obviously going to continue to contract that. Um, again, you kind of look at, you know, South African unemployment, we are heading in the wrong direction, unfortunately. That, you know, and it doesn't seem like we're going to see, see a reversal. Um, that trend is kind of clear. The trend the other way is also kind of clear for me. Um, uh, SAGDP growth, we are expecting a, a nice rebound this year, obviously coming off a lower base. We should be back to pre-coronavirus levels. They say, you know, out to about 2023 at the moment, um, US GDP growth, okay, we, you know, we haven't uh, had the latest uh, GDP numbers, but we have had uh, last month's estimate for our buys up from 4% to 4.3%, so a robust recovery there as well. Um, overall, you know, we've got IMF uh, forecast, and I'll talk a little bit more about it under oil, but IMF is forecasting global growth at around 6% for, for 2021. Um, if you look at, uh, okay, so this is now what's happening in the vaccines. Uh, so South Africa, we, I think, you know, the vaccine rollout has been a problem in South Africa. We, we can't deny it. Um, I think there's a huge concerns that we are going to face a third wave uh, locally. Uh, the US also, we've had coronavirus numbers picking up a little bit, which has, has uh, brought a little bit of concern. Um, I heard one of the, uh, one of our, um, uh, our insurance uh, CEOs chatting about the, the UK and its vaccine rollout and just saying, you know, South Africa must be careful. We obviously probably the base cases for them that, that we're going to go through a, a third, a, you know, a, a pretty steep third wave uh, of the virus. Um, and he, and he, one of the, the reasons that he pointed that out was that um, we, you know, the, the United Kingdom, even though it had one of the more aggressive vaccine rollouts, um, is still seeing coronavirus numbers spiking. Data doesn't support that, unfortunately. So we've seen the UK is the UK rate, uh, like active cases rate, is dropping significantly. It does look like uh, the vaccine is having an, a, like a fantastic impact on the virus, and uh, and and you know, like I said in last month's presentation, we're starting to get the feeling, certainly from a financial market point of view, we can put we can put the coronavirus in an area of mirror. Enough is understood about it. Enough is priced into stocks. Um, that we can kind of start to assume from a financial point of view. Not, I'm not saying let's not wear masks and go out and be irresponsible. I'm saying from the way that we invest, we, we are now well through where we can see the end of coronavirus. And we need to start looking at what's going to happen next. Um, we can see that one of the bellwethers uh, of the coronavirus has been, has been Israel, obviously, because they had the ability to roll out vaccines a lot quicker than other countries. Um, and we can see it in their numbers as well. They kind of went through their second wave um, and, and new cases are, are, are dropping off dramatically. So uh, definitely working. Um, I thought I'd include France and India. France has recently gone into lockdowns again. Um, India as well. We're starting to see India really going through its second wave. Uh, France has also had numbers going up. It's the delay on the, the, the European uh, vaccine rollout uh, that really is causing this. So um, if you look at the overall doses, we've had uh, you know, so 710 uh, million doses. 
Uh, that's uh, over the last month because we do this presentation once a month. Last month was 305 million. So there's significant progress. We are rolling out the vaccine uh, well. 5.15% um, uh, have received at least one dose. And I remember those that dose number up at the top includes people that have, you know, you would count one dose and then the same person having a second dose. So, so uh, 710 million people haven't been vaccinated. <laughs> that way. Um, but 5.1% uh, of people have received at least one dose. Uh, the world currently has 134 million active cases. But like I said, from a financial market point of view, um, we kind of have a solution now. So we would need to look through uh, through the coronavirus and, 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 and start to invest uh, for what is coming next. Um, okay, one okay, important chart. We've been looking at this chart every month for the last couple of months because there's been this persistent fear. Because this, okay, the VIX is the volatility index, it's the uh, CBOE, the Chicago Board Options Exchange measure of 30 day volatility. Now, what does that all mean in English? <laughs> People look at it as a kind of like the fear and greed index, that's how, how they think of it. Um, and it, okay, I, it's difficult to explain, but basically like you can think of it almost in the, the sup, supply and demand of all if you want to, so volatility. When, when volatility is high, options are expensive. When volatility is low, options become very, very cheap. What is an option? An option is a way that you can kind of take insurance against the portfolio. When there's been low incidence, so, you know, like uh, there's, there's a one YRP from investors that always explains this in a wonderful way using a bond. He says, if you've got a bond, um, and your bond hasn't burnt down in 35 years. You know what? You go to you go to get insurance on your bond, and you know your premiums are really low. The risk of your bond burning down is not very high because your bond hasn't burnt down in 30 years. All the actual calculations say, ah, your bond's probably not going to burn, burn down. Your premiums are very low. What happens if your bond burns down and then you rebuild your bond and go to, to try and buy insurance? Your premiums are very high because now there's been an event that uh, that makes you very nervous, right? Your, your bond burns down. Uh, now it's going to be very expensive for you to, to buy insurance. Now that's kind of like a way that you can think about volatility in markets as well. Um, we were doing just fine. We had 10 years almost of, of you know, just a 10 year bull market where we had, you know, monetary policy that was, was loose. We had interest rates starting to rise. We had, you know, unemployment in the US at like 3.8%. Things were great. Volatility was persistently low. We were down at kind of like between 10 and 12 on, on, on the VIX. Um, and then our bond burned down, <laughs> and the bond burning down was the coronavirus. And we saw volatility spiking all the way out to kind of the like, you know, same kind of spike that we saw in the 2008 the credit crisis, a market collapse. That's what happened last year. And what's happened since then is we've seen that volatility has persistently been above 20. That VIX has been elevated for a long time. And it just meant that even though we've seen a lot of these financial market instruments rally and return to levels that they were at before the coronavirus, certainly in the tech sector, but now, you know, in the back to work stock, the likes of Royal Caribbean and Disney. I mean, Disney had a blinder of a year up until this month, um, based on the fact that the world is going to open up again. Um, but the volatility index was still high. People hadn't accepted that we were through the coronavirus. Yet. There was still a lot of nervousness around the pricing, um, the pricing of risk. Um, what's happened now, and it's, uh, yeah, I kind of did this chart, and then all the headlines started breaking. Up. Oh, volatility is broken down below 20. So you can see we're now at 16.9. Volatility is now dropping, which means that the market is starting to price less fear into it. The, the market is settling down. It's I think one of the reasons that we've just had such a good month on stocks as well. Um, okay, so okay, before I get to kind of like what uh, market movements and stock movements, uh, we normally do one story as well. So big story for this month. I mean, we could have done Suez Canal, but I decided let's do Archegos uh, Capital Management. So incredible story. We'll take away. Okay, so one, one, Bill Huang, who's pictured on, on, on the screen there. Um, he's very reticent. He's a, he's a, he's a very un, under, the, under the radar kind of guy. He's not your typical hedge fund manager. Right? He was taking absolutely enormous bets using swaps, which is a type of derivative um, that you know essentially didn't allow everyone to kind of understand the size of the positions that he was taking and what he was doing. Um, kind of at his peak, he, he had about $30 billion in his, uh, that was his net worth. I think he was at about $20 billion when, um, when this all fell apart, but he had leveraged up five times. He had over $100 billion uh, exposure across the banks. And it's one of the reasons we saw, saw really strange movements in the market, especially in kind of the, the, the stocks that he was holding. So one of the stocks was Spotify, 
Um, he was, uh, I think, holding Viacom as well. Uh, and we saw very weird movements as, as we basically went through a, like almost a long-term capital management event where, where all these derivatives just imploded. The, uh, uh, what the saying goes, gear today, gone tomorrow. So one of the reasons that I'm not geared in our management practice. <laughs> but um, I mean, essentially, you know, his, his fund imploded um, and it's caused enormous drama in, in two banks specifically. So we do hold banks. So we've actually just reduced our financial exposure there. So we've sold our city group, which I'll show you in a second, but we still hold JP Morgan. Now, first thing in our investment committee that we hold regularly, um, the question is, oh, is JP Morgan exposed to this, uh, these derivative losses? And it's a real risk. Unfortunately, um, you know, as I say, as I got up on the screen there, Credit Suisse lost uh, $4.7 billion, Nomura lost uh, $2 billion. We saw their stock prices absolutely collapsing. Um, you know, I'm not gonna go through this whole history, but essentially, this was a, you're not a black swan event, but it's one of those events in bank, you know, when you're holding banking stocks that you can't actually price in. Um, it's kind of the view that I gave in, in our investment committee was, you know, banks are black boxes. You, you know, yes, you can have, you know, incredibly strict controls around them. Yes, you can go and look at their, you know, their, their kind of tier one capital ratios. Yes, you can look at the credit losses. Yes, yeah, all of these things are valuable metrics to help you understand the strength of a bank. But every now and again, the nature of the business is something comes totally out of left field as well. Um, when that happens, how do you protect against that? One, you have diversified portfolios, you have diversified exposures. It's also one of the reasons that banks are perpetually cheap. They don't trade like other companies. They, they generally do have uh, lower, lower PE ratios because they are complicated, complicated animals to price. Um, but yeah. What I buy credit suites on the world. So we're looking, we're looking at that currently. Okay, so, so the way that we, we manage money is we we have we take a top-down and a bottom-up approach. So we, we look at kind of the, we first look at the macro uh, view. So I'm just talking about from, from the point of view of the managed portfolio. Um, we take a macro view and we say basically, do we want to be over underweight sectors? You know, are we happy with financials? Do we want to be in financials here? Do we want to be in tech here? Do we want to be in consumer facing, consumer staple? What sector do we want? Why? And does that, does that work in our macro view? Um, we in the process of reducing financial exposure because we were very heavy into financials just post the, the crash. So we were buying in over that. It pushed our, our financial exposure very, very high. So I can't buy it for the portfolio if, if that's what you're looking at. From a speculative point of view, we, we have seen some structured ideas from, from, our, um, from some of our partners, on especially, specifically on credit suites, um, where you can kind of almost take, you know, you take some capital protection in, inside, a, inside an option trade uh, and play the recovery. I, you know, Credit Suisse, you look at Credit Suisse and UBS as the national, uh, you know, they're, they're essentially national pride banks of Switzerland. I don't see them going under. So yes, in the longer term, even though they are going to take a haircut, I would probably be buying Credit Suisse at this stage. I might do it with a little bit of protection around the, the, the position as well. But um, yeah, I, haven't, I haven't specifically looked at it. So, so it would be kind of a gut, a, a gut feel trade to do that. Um, not not for client portfolios, but potentially I can have a look at it for next next week uh, just to get get a, a better sense of it. But yeah, absolutely. Generally, my my feeling is if you are a long term holder and you're not here and you're not trading actively, um, these kind of sell offs where there's like a, a panic sell off on news flow. Generally, if if the company is strong enough and it's not going to impact the company in a way that is permanent, so it's not going to lose credit to its customers. It's 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 almost like the VW the VW scandal. Okay, that was a little bit more reputational damage. But if it's something like um, like what happened to Nvidia, um, when Nvidia had uh, uh, obviously okay, so basically the price of Bitcoin collapsed and there was a huge glut of um, of graphics cards coming onto the market. And they they missed it, they missed the earnings slightly, and suddenly like the stock price was down seventy percent because it was priced for perfection. But they had had a wobble on earnings. But the wobble was clearly because of something that was going to be temporary. That for me is an opportunity. I haven't I haven't looked at credit suites enough to know the impact of it. And like I said, banks are kind of black boxes. So I'm kind of nervous to give you the thing. But yeah, why not speculative buy? Um, got a hand up at the moment. Uh, anyway, yeah, okay. But just just ask me in the chat if you've got uh, if you've got questions or in the Q and A boxes. Okay, so yeah, that's the whole story for this month. Um, the, the interesting news. So this, okay, so I've got, I've just actually left last month's chart in here as well. So this is what, this was actually the uh, February movements on the market. And you can see the theme that we discussed last time, so that that was playing out. It was very much the, the you know, last month it was 
you know, we had the tech stocks that had run so hard after the coronavirus starting to correct. Um, we had, you, you know, the likes of Tesla down 20%, Amazon down, Apple down, Microsoft down, everything was down, but we had this big pop in, in, in oil and gas. So we had this, you know, ExxonMobil up, up 20%. Um, you know, we had, uh, like I said, Disney was flying. I mean, Disney was up, se okay, 7%, but Disney was up like 50%, 60% off lows. It was really pumping. Um, we also had the banks doing it exceptionally well. So the banks, which were, were our kind of very overweight play, um, into February, we, we kind of said, okay, in March, we have to start unwinding these positions. We've kind of reached our targets. Um, so what has happened this month um, is basically almost the opposite. <laughs> so this is this is one month since then. And I said I said last month, I said, we, we, we're kind of selling out of our, our banking, like our, we, we're selling out of Citigroup, sold out of Schlumberger and um, ExxonMobil, which we, we held, we bought in November. Um, we said, listen, we think oil markets are a little bit high at the moment. We think this is probably the time to exit. It turns out, and I said, I think that you know, Goldman Sachs had a target of $80 a, a barrel on crude, uh, on Brent crude. And I said, well, it's Goldman Sachs, so we, we can de almost definitely go the other way on that prediction. But yes, there is a very good case that, that Brent crude at that stage in the 70s could go to 80s. You know, we managing a long term portfolio. We're not trying to time this, you know, month to month. Um, but as it happens, it worked out really well for us. We've had oil and gas under a lot of pressure. We've exited all oil and gas positions from the portfolio. Um, and Citigroup hasn't hasn't run too much further. We're out of Citigroup. But what has happened is we've seen an enormous uh, move back into technology, which is great because we're buying Equinix, which is a, is a, is a REIT. But we see mice gains in the back of that. We hold Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. We don't hold Facebook and Apple. Uh, we don't hold Tesla either, but um, we do hold NVIDIA up 22% this month. Uh, but we've seen a big recovery in, in, in tech over the last month, as I think you know, just the fears of what's going on have subsided a little bit. Um, so yeah, just to, just to run through what exactly we did on the portfolio. Like I said, we've got no portfolio moves this month. Um, you know, we're not an active trading portfolio. Please don't think that we are an active trader. We just happen to have a lot of moves. Uh, generally, you know, for the kind of more stock picky sessions, I do deep dives into different sectors. So we're probably going to, we might, I want to have a look at the pharma sector for a while, um, but we're going to take three or four companies and we'll go do a deep dive into the sector as a presentation separately from these monthly, these monthly reviews. But just so that you knew what happened. Um, so this is pretty much the, the entry and exit. We entered at 41.68 on ExxonMobil, uh, exited at 54. Uh, so it was kind of a, sh a much shorter term trade, uh, you know, 30% point to point. We had Slumberger from a long time back. Okay, sorry, Citigroup, same Citigroup. We bought Citigroup after the collapse. That's when we were picking up our financial exposure um, and we were kind of doubling up on US, US banks when everyone else was panicking and saying, this is the end of the world. We were like, oh, we're not sure if it is the end of the world, but let's be pretty certain that something like Citigroup is going to survive. Uh, bought into Citigroup and uh, we paid a 51% uh, point to point profit on that. We were too heavy in financial, so we've exited that as well. We also managed to scoop three dividends over the period. Um, Slumberger, like I said, we've had Slumberger for a long time, kind of upstream oil and gas. Um, it has been a perennial underperformer, and you know we kind of used this recovery to, to turf it out of the portfolio as well. Um, and what we did is we replaced it with Equinix. Um, so if, yeah, I kind of went through Equinix. Since I don't have a stock pick, I'm just going to kind of run through the investment case for this again. Um, but yeah, Equinix is essentially a, it's a data center operator, but it operates as a real estate investment trust. So it operates as a REIT. Um, it's it's a fantastic company. Uh, there's no question about that. The only concern is. Uh, you know, is it too expensive? <laughs> um, and that's really the, the, the worry. Uh, so if you look at it, what's happened on the, on the stock recently, I mean, we've still got a lot of the institutional analysts covering it. They've all reviewed their recommendations. They've obtained their price targets. Why are they maintaining their price targets? And, and what do we see in the stock? A lot of people think that they can't keep going like they, they are. They can't keep growing dollar-based revenue at 10 to 11% a year. How can you do that? The point is they can because they have long-term leases with Google Cloud, Azure, Amazon, Zoom, all of it. This platform is actually running on a data center, probably hosted by Equinix because it's Zoom. So and Zoom is a client of Equinix. So probably not in South Africa, but um, but basically that's that's the concept. Now, what happens is the, the most of their leases uh, for these for these uh, data centers expire further than, than 2035. So they've got annuity income coming through for a revenue coming through for a long time. One of the concerns on the results was that there's, they, they don't have a moat around them. There's not enough competition in the data center. Anyone can throw up a data center and go and steal clients for it. 
why that different? I think it's in North America. I want to say it might be North America and Canada, but their, their presence, their next 15 biggest competitors added together. You, so, so they are essentially the size in those markets of their next 15 competitors combined. They really are the juggernaut in the sector. And yes, the, the small, more dynamic guys can get come in, but at that st stage, they've still got huge economies of scale as well. Where did we buy it? We kind of looked at the long-term trend line. We said, listen, this is a temporary event on FNX, same as kind of the NVIDIA thing. Yes, people are worried about competition. It's one set of earnings. This is a great business, and it has been a great business for a long time. Um, it kind of almost hit the trend line there. We kind of bought into the stock. Um, and we're happy, we're kind of benefiting from the, 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 the run up. Uh, you know, you might run into trouble if you join the two trend lines, I'll draw it if you want. Um, so if you, you might run into a little bit of, if you, know, if you, know, you might run into a little bit of trouble with it. It's there, technically, maybe it'll come down, maybe it'll be an equilateral triangle, who knows? No, it's technicals, but this is a position. We generally hold positions for three to five years is what we're looking for anyway. Um, we're not trying to generate capital gain, uh, at least uh, income for, for, for investors that are sitting in, in private stock portfolios, which we're managing. We're looking for really robust companies with good entry points to get in. I think this is one that we, you can probably buy and hold for the next you know, five, 10 years, and you'll be, you'll be solid on it. So um, yeah, that's kind of uh, our Equinix position at the moment. Uh, and okay, okay, so what's happening? Okay, I'm just going to run through the other markets quickly. I don't, yeah, there's not a lot to do here. Okay, so oil markets, we talked a little bit about the oil markets and why we exited there. Um, so a little bit of a different story from last month. Uh, so last month we were talking all about how oil markets, uh, you know, we had supply curbs in place, uh, we had demand starting to return. Uh, we had no real, you know, we had inventories going down. It looked positive as anything for oil. Um, we, I, didn't, I didn't go through the whole backwardation of the curve, but uh, essentially oil markets were looking very, very robust and, and oil prices were expected to go higher. And I was kind of defending why we were selling oil <laughs> stocks at that stage, um, because a lot of that is already priced into, into the positions. Now, What's happened this month? We obviously had the OPEC meeting. Um, now, what has happened? Okay, we've had a couple of weird things happen in the oil market recently. Uh, so, one, we had that big Texas freeze a couple of months ago, which kind of support, took some supply out of the market. We had the Suez Canal getting blocked and stopping oil going to Europe, which played havoc with prices as well. In the short term, short term event, they're going to clear the canal. People think the oil is going to flow again. Um, you know, CapEx does remain low in the sector, and that should be supportive of, of, of higher oil prices. But what has happened now? We had the big OPEC meeting and everyone is expecting output curves to remain unchanged. We, we weren't expecting them to lift those output curves. Um, what happened, there was a phone call from the US Energy Secretary before the, the meeting to the, the Saudi Energy Secretary, just expressing uh, the US's desire for, just a friendly desire for oil prices to be a lot lower. Um, so what happened? Uh, Saudi Arabia, who essentially uh, will go into it well tomorrow. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, so that is that's another point. So we just got another point here on, on the chat. Um, will, it, will will you know kind of the return of airlines uh, increase the demand for it? Absolutely, no, no question. Uh, we actually looked at it in yesterday's Invesco meeting. I think uh, jet. Yeah, so, so so air travel and jet propulsion. Uh, I might be wrong on this, and there was some of the other analysts was talking about it, I might have misled it. I think it accounts for 30, for 23% of, of, of global oil demand is, is coming from, uh, from air freight and, and passenger airlines, et cetera. So um, I might be wrong on that, but it's significant. It's not, it's not, a, small, it's not a small number. Um, so yes, that will, will improve, but a lot of that demand, again, it's already factored in. I mean, we had about a 20% drop. You know, the world was consuming pre-COVID about 100 uh, million barrels per day. Uh, dropped to I think about 81, 82 million barrels per day under COVID. Uh, and that has largely recovered. We're not quite at pre-COVID levels yet, but we will get there and we will probably go through it as well. Um, so what has happened? Um, it all comes down to expectations. All of this was priced into the market. That's why we had oil going from almost negative all the way up to $70 a barrel. What has happened now? Energy Secretary phoned, uh, phoned the, the Saudi Arabian energy minister and said, we want lower oil prices. And surprise, surprise, 
Um, there's a lot of pool there. And so what happened is they, uh, Saudi Arabia decided, and, and within OPEC, they came out with the decision that they are at least going to start to lift those uh, from May. So we're starting to see OPEC allowing more, more supply onto, onto the market. Um, totally surprising decision from, from OPEC. No one expected that. Everyone was expecting that. We talked about this, we, thought, uh, this, uh, we talked about it last night. We thought OPEC was going to keep uh, a very tight control on the market and almost gamble that the US is not going to bring shale, um, you know, shale back on stream um, fast enough anyway. And we were going to, see, you know, there was a potential spike out to 85, maybe 80, 85 dollars a barrel. What's happened is they've kind of released it. And, and that was the other kind of factor that we said was at play. You've always got to remember that the oil market that we're in at the moment um, is looking forward at, at what's happening with electric vehicles. Uh, electric vehicles are being rolled out, and there's only so much time that that, that oil will um, will have that kind of huge uh, passenger vehicle demand. So it's yeah, it could yeah, it could change. Um, it could change quickly, and I think that's one of the reasons that you know, they really do want to pump volume. They, they want to get volume through the market as much as they want to control price. They, they are trying to put, you know create a monopoly pricing environment. You know that that's what OPEC does. That's what OPEC has done for decades. Um, but at the same time, they do realize that that uh, one of the big demand factors will eventually drop away, um, and you know. The, the amount of oil that Saudi Arabia is sitting on will never be used. If we do use it, we're all going to be dead from, from cough marks and poisoning and heat and whatever. But um, yeah, basically that happened and that's pulled oil prices back below, well below 70. So we're sitting at $62, so just about $62 a barrel at the moment. Um, and basically what OPEC is betting on now, they, you know, like this, this month, what do I think OPEC is saying? I think OPEC is saying, We've got a pump uh, because the, the demand is going to be a little bit more robust than people think. I'm trying to stay away from conspiracy theories um, around what's happening between the Saudis and the US. But, uh, but yeah, maybe they think that uh, there's going to be more robust demand. So this is off the actual OPEC reports up at the top. Um, like I said earlier, the IMF has got about a 6% um, uh, GDP uh, uh, growth rate uh, for, for the, the globe. Um, for at least for 2021. Um, so, you know, OPEC, they're looking at about uh, 5.1 is, is the estimate for 2021. So they're actually a little bit more conservative than, than the IMF, uh, but maybe, I don't know, that maybe gives them room to move a little bit, but that's kind of what, you know, those are OPEC ex expectations up, again, up at the top left. Um, yeah, so oil markets will continue to be interesting. I mean, obviously they, they feature in kind of inflation predictions, et cetera, but, um, we're out of our oil stocks, so I don't really care anymore. <laughs> this month we're looking at platinum instead. Um, what's happening in the currency market? So this is always a good slide. We're going to add it. I'll add a, a, a pound one for you guys next month. Once a month, we get all the estimates from all the big banks as to what's happening on currency. Um, so what's happening at the moment? Like I said, we are strong. We are really strong at, at 14.53. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we, we run a, a treasury service where we take money in and out of the country for clients. And I can tell you, demand has picked up again. We, we were very quiet. At, at kind of, and I mean, last month I said, you know, if you watched last month's presentation, I said, we're above 15 rand to, 15 rand to a dollar. I would probably wait for sub, you know, at least sub 15 before moving currency. It looks like we're quite range bound at the moment. I think we can probably get better prices. What's happened now? Uh, we've, had, we've had a sell off, that's great. I'm, Glad I didn't tell you guys to take all your money out at 15, 20. It's really been shooting me down in this uh, in this uh, presentation. But um, now I do think I'll put my head on the block for next month when it breaks to 14 rand. You can all throw tomatoes at me. But for now, I think you know you've got this little sideways channel here that says it, it's kind of between 14, 50, and 15 is, is where the range has been recently. Um, and what's happened in the in the bank market? So. Remember the banks, these, these bank analysts that we're talking about now, these are the economists that inform the decisions of the major uh, financial institutions of the globe. These financial institutions are publishing to, to their clients. They're also making decisions of, on the, at their own banks based on this information. So it's important to have a look at these. Um, what's happened is we've got Goldman Sachs is the most bearish. Like I said, Goldman Sachs, you always got to be careful of their predictions in the public. But they, they think that the RAND is, is going to get much stronger down to 1380. That's the, the 12 month prediction from Goldman Sachs. Um, the most bearish banks are Wells Fargo and JP Morgan. 
Um, each of these analysts that, and, and economists that are, are publishing these recommendations are ranked on their prediction. How accurate have their predictions been over time? If they don't make a lot of predictions, they don't get ranked. Um, if they regularly predict once a month, they get ranked. Wells Fargo is the best ranked analyst covering currency markets that we have available to us. And, um, well, not that we have available, that is in this specific survey, it's a Reuters survey. Um, they have a prediction of 1625. They are at the upper end of the range. Um, and it's, you know, even though you know, predicting currency is impossible. So that's why like trying to say where the rand is going to be or where the rand is not going to be is very, very difficult. Uh, it always makes a fool of you. That's why. So we'll probably be at 14 and Goldman Sachs will probably be right. We'll be at 1380 by next month. But um, the best predicting bank uh, is at 1625. But also the range tells you kind of where the estimates are. The estimates are not up at 17 and a half, 18 like they were when Swede Bank was predicting that. Um, what is interesting to note here as well is Investec, who's, uh, and we run a lot of our stuff for Investec, um, their move has been big. They were previously last month, their estimate was for a 12 month target around uh, 1535. They've currently moved that up to 1590. Um, so there's a big, a big change in their in their target. Citigroup as well, which is one of the biggest US banks, they have also moved their target up, uh, 12 target from 1513 to 1524. That's lifted the smart estimate and it's lifted the median estimate up at the uh, up at the top right. Um, last month we were about 1519 as the median estimate, we're now at 1530. So the, the analyst, like while the currency has been strengthening, people have started to 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 actually, or at least the economists have started to raise their targets on currency as well. So for me. The fundamental kind of side, which is kind of how I think of the, the economists uh, predicting this, as well as the technicals, they're both kind of in alignment saying, guys, this is the time to go and buy dollars, sell rand, this is the time to, to if you're going to take money offshore, now is the time to do it, not last month, um, or even a derivative position. I've got derivative positions on in currency for myself anyway, because I think, I really think buying it around 14.53, you're going to be able to drop off at, 15, uh, at, at least at 15 if it's a short term trade. Um, if you're really patient, I know I'll be dropping at 15. Um, but if you're really patient, you can make big bucks if, you, if you're moving, uh, if, you, if you're aiming all the way at 15.50, which is the top of the range. So that's kind of the, the, currency, the currency predictions uh, for April. Um, what's happening in the currency? Why did we strengthen like this? Like, uh, is this, you know, first question a lot of people, the first question I got asked in Vesco was, um, is this RAND strength or is this dollar weakness? What, what is going on here? So it's a little bit of both. Um, a nice way of looking at that, you can either look at it against gold or you can look at it against something like the dollar index, which I've got up here, um, is that it's a little bit of both this month. So what's happened is, yes, initially the RAND was strengthening while the dollar was strengthening which means that it was actually RAND strength coming through in that pair because the dollar was strengthening against everything else, but the RAND was strengthening against the dollar. What's happened now is we've seen the dollar just pull back a little bit from that kind of 93.30 level this month all the way down to kind of 92.27 uh, where I pulled it this morning. Um, that means that the dollar is starting to weaken against international currencies, um, yet the RAND is still getting, and the RAND is obviously getting strong on the back of that. So that that for me it was like kind of at about 1470 that was kind of brand strengthening that last little leg down to 1450 that was the dollar weakness kind of like just giving it a little bit of a tailwind so could it reverse yeah i do think it's going to reverse so that's my bet for next month we'll see if i'm right or wrong um okay that's that's uh currencies uh now let's just look at central bank actions so i'm running out of time so we'll be very quick on the rest um okay what's happening in the central banks we have FOMC minutes coming out this week and uh now, interestingly, so I pulled this, yes, I think I pulled this yesterday. Um, these are three, okay, so these are three snapshots. Okay, so the easy way to look at like, what are Fed expectations? That one, the Fed is not going to raise interest rates anytime soon. They're not concerned about inflation. They, you know, they, they're willing to, you know, most of the information we got from FMC minutes was already, was already included in uh, what we chatted about when, when Jerome Powell was speaking uh, last month. But, um, it's still going to be a long time before they start to take an aggressive stance. I, there was no way that those minutes spooked the market. We had the S&P making record highs uh, immediately after the minutes. The market was not afraid of, 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 of a taper. There's no taper tantrum going on. Yet, at the same time, there is something else going on in the market. So if you look here, so the, the, the kind of the top left chart, um, that was three months ago. So the, these are charts of uh, probabilities based on federal funds futures, right? 
So three months ago, in the December meeting, federal funds futures were predicting that there was no chance um, of a rating. Um, so th there was there was there was no chance of a rate hike. It was going to be uh, the rates were going to stay stable at least. Uh, have I got the right one here? Current target rate. I might have, sorry, I might have put the wrong chart. But basically, three months ago, there was no there was no chance of a rate hike at all. Um, then two months ago, uh, we had a six percent chance of a rate hike starting to creep in. Sorry, I think I put the wrong chart. I'm to press the button. Sorry. But six months, uh, three, at least two months ago, we started to have the probability that the, first there was no chance, then there was a, a, a chance of uh, a 6.5% chance that we would see uh, the Fed lift interest rates by 25 basis points. Uh, following the Fed uh, minutes, we've now got a 10.4% chance from a 6.5% chance. So there's slowly seems to be the market is accepting that we are going to see high interest rates coming from the Fed in uh, in time to come. So that that's starting to price in the expectation that inflation is going to be achieved, and we're going to start seeing interest rates lift. For me, it just signals that you know we will see tapering at some point. Um, from the Fed minutes, they're not they're not winding down the 120 billion bond buying program. It's not winding down yet. But um, but it's going to come, and the market needs to start getting getting used to the fact that they are going to start to tank at some point. Uh, but hopefully, the, the economic figures are robust enough to handle it. Um, okay, let's quickly look at the managed portfolio. So okay, this is kind of like my, 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 uh, our portfolio versus the MSCI World Benchmark, which is the benchmark of the World Index. It slightly underperformed last month. It was kind of neck and neck. We were up, uh, we we're both up about just under three percent. Um, they pipped us slightly, and um, you know, the month before we did we did outperform. Um, but yeah, it's like I said, it's always difficult to look month to month. But over, over time, yeah, so it was it was a decent month. Both both uh, MSCI World and our portfolio up nicely, well over three percent up. Um, what's happening over a longer period of time? Uh, yeah, we've been outperforming since the initial. We've had four years of outperformance, but I'm struggling this year, really struggling. So we we're a little bit light. We we, we trimmed our tech a little bit early. Um, we've now trimmed our oil and gas, but that seems to be working out. Um, we're still sitting on a little bit too much cash, and that's why we're sitting on about 15% cash that we're looking to deploy. Um, and we're looking to deploy it into weakness as well, which is kind of, it's, it's putting a little bit of a lag on our, on our position. You can see since inception, we're up about 90% in dollars versus the 70% of the benchmark. Um, and yeah, basically, you know, we've, we've been underperforming slightly. So we're about a percent behind at the moment compared to the benchmark this year. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't read too much into it. We kind of had steady outperformance from, from October 2017, which is the graph on the bottom right hand side. We kind of really accelerated. We were like 12, 15 percent um, ahead of where the, um, we were 12, 15 percent ahead of the benchmark last year. And then I, I was like, oh, I've got to take some profits here. <laughs> I wanted to just reduce risk. We had this huge run up. We still had a lot of problems um, in, in the global economy. And I kind of started, I, down, I, like, I kind of downweighted Microsoft and some of the tech companies. Just And also it was just a natural re-weighting to keep clients you know, in, in a safe position. We had like 10 percent of the portfolio was sitting in Amazon at that point just because of growth. And we were taking a 4 percent position. Um, and we had to downweight it. So we downweight the tech. We kind of we did a little bit of the oil stuff, but we were sitting a little bit heavy on cash. Um, I haven't got the sharp ratio up here, but our sharp ratio is way better than the market, and it's because of that cash component. So, in risk terms, we're a lot better than our in risk 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 weighted terms. We're much much better than the market. But yeah, this year we, we our, in pure performance terms we're lagging a little bit, but it still has been four years of our performance. So. Kind of happy, uh, but it would be nice to get back to having that nice, nice lead on our on our benchmark. Um, but not not that I'm going to talk about it too much because you can't let this kind of thing get uh, put pressure on you. Otherwise, you make bad decisions and then you don't make the best of money. So, um, yeah. Uh, sorry, we've got a question on what is the minimum in the portfolio. Um, the minimum is about fifty thousand dollars. So we do all of this as uh, stock portfolios. So we do it as. Um, as PSPs, uh, it's not a fund that you, you unitize or anything like this. We do it as a model portfolio, and then we're a stockbroking company. Uh, the nice aspect of that is we don't have manco fees or anything like that, which just gets passed straight on to you. Um, you know, at least the, the manco fees aren't reflected in the performance because there is no manco. So it it gives you uh, a nice kicker in terms of it's a very very cost efficient way of doing it. It's also very very transparent because when we buy it, 
you've got logins, we turn off your trading access because we're obviously doing the, the, the position sizing and the buying and selling for you. But at any point you can log in and pull a statement and look at exactly what we're doing in the portfolio as well. You're not gonna get a unit of Rand Swiss uh, Global Equity Fund. Uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna see all our underlying positions and you're gonna be able to see, hey, you guys didn't execute at, at the right time for me. You're gonna have a huge level of transparency, which I prefer with clients. Um, there's no, so, so you know that there's no shenanigans going on, which is great, which is whenever you go to these houses and we, we kind of think of unitizing it, then we go and chat with someone about a manco or, you know, we go and have a, we, we go and have a discussion with, and we had a discussion with UBS about listing it in Switzerland and actually doing it almost like a, a mini ETF. And, you know, then we've got to, we've got to allow them to execute for the clients and you don't see the, you don't see where they're executing in the market. You don't get, it, it becomes very opaque and, and I've never liked that. So we've always kind of stuck with the, the way I came from, which was stockbroking, nice, transparent, you can see it. Um, yeah, the fact sheets, uh, so we've got the February fact sheets are out. I can send you links to them. Um, the uh, March fact sheets uh, should be out by Monday or Tuesday. Um, I'll send those around as well if you're interested. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like the, the way the portfolio works. Um, yeah, I'm just going to quickly run through it because we're over the time. Investment philosophy, we've already talked about this, but it's basically top down meets bottom up. We do a macro overlay. We have an investment committee that looks at it. We use a lot of quantitatively based models to kind of select and monitor the stocks for us. Um, and then we kind of do the bottom up, the, the bottom -up uh, work on the companies as well. Um, and I kind of share that with you guys, uh, you know, whenever I can on, on these Zoom meetings as well, kind of go through our thinking on buying and selling individual companies. Uh, yep, so there it is. Minimum is 50,000. This is my specific portfolio. We do run it with a whole investment committee uh, kind of decisions, but I am the ultimate decision maker on the portfolio. Um, we've got a whole lot of baskets coming out, which is Europe and a whole lot of other, other offerings, which, which will be exciting, but this is kind of one that we've run for almost five years now. It's got solid track record behind it. Um, you know, we've got my own money in it as well. So it's a real track record, it's not a fake track record. Um, yeah, and we generally charge 1% for it, which is kind of in line with all asset managers these days. Um, all those uh, performance stats are after fees as well, so there's not a fee over and above that. Uh, like I said, we, we are on end-to-end -end solutions, so if you are interested in it, you know, we can do the currency conversion. You literally can dump money into a local account. We'll take care of the whole investment process for you, uh, from literally setting up the account locally to receive your funds, all the way to reporting monthly and doing these little updates on, on what we're thinking about inside the presentation. That's it. If you're interested, you can go to applications and accounts. You can kind of go and put in your details. Um, we, will, we are going to try and distribute this. Uh, I'll, I'll stick the fact sheets and I'll stick a link to the fact sheets when we, we create a YouTube video for this right here. Um, but yeah, opening accounts really simple. We just need FICA. You need to do an online mandate. Go through it depending on where you want to hold it. We can we, we manage on, on uh, Saxo Bank and Swiss Quote. So, you know, both of them, I mean, Saxo is custodial with Citibank and uh, Swiss Quote, is a, you know, it's a, it's a Swiss bank. So it's got all the European protection inside it. The nice thing about Swiss Quote is it's actually also a bank account. You can have a credit card um, and, you know, it's got an IBAN number so you can make third party payments. The other one is more of an investment account, but it's a little bit more cost efficient for, for smaller clients. So that's the, the way that we run it. And that's that's the ball game. Thanks guys for listening. Um, yeah, so a few minutes over. But uh, yeah, uh, any questions that I've missed? I was going to talk about that. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. You guys are welcome to duck off, but I'm going to just run through my view on FIT quickly as well. Um, and any other questions? So Tesla is back uh, as a buyer. <laughs> okay. So yeah, Tesla, I haven't had Tesla as a buyer, probably, but um, I'm tuned. So we've got lots of clients that own Tesla because they like it and they sit, to, you know, and if, if you like it and you want to take a punt and it's more speculative, absolutely, I can't put it in a, I'm not prepared to put it in a portfolio where I have to look an investor in the eye later and explain why fundamentally he bought Tesla. <laughs> um, but it has been great for clients that have wanted to take a punt that they've exceptionally well. Um, what's, sorry, what's my, uh, close the screen. So what's my view on Adapt IT? Um, good question. Uh, Adapt IT, uh, so obviously a huge group kind of made that offer at, at 800 million rand. Um, they've now had, uh, you know, they've had a counter offer of 1 billion rand from, uh, from the company uh, Volaris, uh, which is a subsidiary of Constellation Software, which is listed in Toronto. Um, the deal is going through at six rand fifty per share, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yesterday, the stock was trading about five eighty eight, so there was there's still like a nice 
There's a nice premium in there um, if you're willing to wait for the deal to go through. There is, there is, um, there is still some time uh, before the deal is obviously going to include as to what the shares. There's a lot that can happen that will make that deal fall apart. But um, yeah, I think it's a pretty solid offer in here. So I saw a huge group was out in the news this morning uh, trying to explain why it was such a bad deal to go to Constellation. But Constellation, they, they're about a $25 billion market cap company, a lot bigger. This is a small transaction for them. Um, what are they going to give adapt IT? They're going to bring in best practices from, uh, from international best practices. Like I said earlier, my view is that US and Canadian companies as well, they have a different way of operating to, to South African companies. And when you bring in those best practices, I think there's a lot of room to, to partner with a local partner like Adapt IT who understands the local environment and then bringing in those kind of best practices from overseas. It, it's almost a surefire way for success. The problem is, as Huge Group points out, you're going to lose it. Um, you guys are going to, you know, you buy Adapt IT now at 588. You, it's going to be another company that gets listed from our exchange. Adapt IT, I think, is a great little business. I don't think the market's valuing it correctly. The huge group and, and Valoris have both picked this up. And they're going to take this thing off the market at a steal. And, and unfortunately, as a shareholder, you're going to lose your Adapt IT at 6 Rand 50. You'll make a nice kick here if you're buying now at, at, at 588. You know, you'll get a, a nice little point to point return there. But um, yeah, it's just sad that, that Spu Shabalala is not going to be talking to us anymore. <laughs> and it's not going to be on exchange, which, which will really suck. Uh, um, I, I think that's gonna it's gonna be a, it's a big it's a it's a pity because it was one of the companies that I saw was like it was a dynamic uh, ICT company that was exciting and it was doing good things in South Africa, um, but the share price never reflected it. And it's it's the same as uh, what happened to Anchor Capital, for example. I mean, you know, the guys listed it and the share price went berserk, and then you know they were they were a very very solid business, very very good asset manager, very clever guys. Um, and the market wasn't rating their stock where it should be. And unfortunately, there was no catalyst to get it to re-rate. They couldn't achieve the valuation, so they delisted it because it's a great business. Why, why should you, why should you have, have a stock that's a liquid that's just sitting there, which is unfortunate. I wish, I wish we had a more robust market, <laughs> if I put it that way. But I think the DAPA team thing is going to be interesting because I don't think huge groups are going to let it go. Um, but I do think for the company specifically, um, it's a good thing. You could, I suppose, go and get exposure to a via Constellation software. In, in, I think it's in Toronto uh, where it's listed. But of course, you're not going to get that specific little Adapt ITR. You're going to get this new tiny little exposure. And most of it is just going to be the other software company. So, very different investment proposition. So, I'll be sad to see Adapt IT go, but um, hopefully for the for the employees and for the customers, uh, it results in a, in a much better experience. I, I do think that uh, that that deal, in my opinion, I think the deal is going to go through. I think huge groups going to fight it, but I, I think maybe you'll get you maybe you'll get a raised offer. You know, you go in at five eighty eight, maybe maybe huge makes another another offer, and you maybe uh, Valoris comes back and, and decides that hey, they'll they'll put two 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 million rand or two billion rand into it at least, which is which is small potatoes for me. So um, yeah, I think it's interesting. That's my view on Adapt IT. Okay, cool guys. I've got to run, but uh, thanks uh, everyone for attending. I will, yeah, we'll plan. We're going to try and cut YouTube. Our YouTube channel is still not great. I'm, I'm a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to these things, so we haven't we haven't yet launched it properly. But we will uh, hopefully put it out as soon as the editorial is ready, and then we'll take it from there. Thanks everyone. Have a great it's Friday. So have a great weekend and enjoy. And we'll see you next month. Um, go to Ransource, go to events. We'll see if there's a whole lot of new events up as well. All right.